Welcome to The Storytellers, the radio show and podcast that features those who choose to leave their mark on the world through the art of story. I'm your host, Grace Salmon. I look forward to our time together today. Now, let's meet our storyteller. Hello and welcome. Betty Lee Crosby is the USA Today best-selling author of 24 novels. She's the recipient of over 40 literary awards, a masterful storyteller. Her debut in 2016 won the Huffington Post Chick Lit Award. Her 2019 release, Emily Gone, won the National World's uh, Women's Fiction Award. And I am just reading her most recent release, The Fault Between Us. It is a novel that takes place in 1906 in San Francisco in an earthquake. Betty will tell you she loves small dogs and all things Southern and loves to talk with readers. So Betty, thank you for joining me on the Storyteller Microphone. My pleasure. It's really an honor because as I watch your amazing body of work, I'm called to the fact that so many women come to the storytelling aspect of their careers later in life. I've written several books, but my novel just came out. So tell me how you got to storytelling. Somewhat the same way. Um, I never started out to be a writer. Actually, I started out to be an artist. And um, my one of my early jobs was on the drawing board designing pantyhose packaging. And I would design the package, I'd get it all ready, and then I'd have to present it to the salesman. And salesmen are just notorious for hating detail work. So I'd present the package and I'd say, excuse me, sir, but I need some copy for the back of this package. I was a kid. I was an ingenue. <laughs> um, and they'd say, make something up, kid. Whatever you make up is fine with me. So I did. <laughs> and, you know, the thing is, it's great to be so young and so innocent that you don't know what you're doing wrong. So I wrote copy for the packages. And then in time, they said, gee, you know, you're a pretty good writer. You want to write the company newsletter? So I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, never dreaming that this would be a career. And then I went from that into marketing and I wrote mm -hmm. for marketing all my career. And then when I got to, I was a senior vice president. And there was nowhere else that I could really go logistically. And, but yet the job had I, I'd, I'd outgrown the job. It was no longer challenging. Mm -hmm. So um, as I walked on the treadmill in the morning, I started thinking, because I'm a voracious reader. So I started thinking, I think I'll write a book. I think I'll write a book. And, you know, the reason it came about is when I was writing for business, people so often would say to me, gee, you're a really good writer. Have you ever thought of writing a book? And I'd say, I have nothing to write a book about. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was writing for business. And the whole pro whole uh, thing there was, tell, say what you have to say, tell the story and get to the point right away. And with fiction, it's really so different. It's like you don't want to get to the point until the very last minute almost. <laughs> so it was quite a change. But I started thinking about it. And when I started writing my first book, I didn't even type. I mean, I was I started writing it longhand and having my secretary type it up. And I quickly learned that you're going to have to type. <laughs> so. Well, there are so many things right there. First of all, so many of us don't have secretaries anymore. And I wonder how many people wear pantyhose. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I can't remember the last time I had them on. Probably well, when we went north for an event. And the pandemic helps mm -hmm. with that. One of the mm -hmm. things that I was also intrigued by, Betty, is that you write Southern fiction, Southern fiction that stirs the heart. Mm -hmm. I would say that until I started doing the storytellers outside of To Kill a Mockingbird, I never mm -hmm. really gave a lot of thought to Southern fiction. But then I interviewed Claire Fullerton and the wonderful new novelist, Robert Gwaltney, and I started paying attention mm -hmm. to Southern fiction. I'll be interviewing Mandy Haynes in a couple of weeks. How did you come to Southern fiction and how do you define that? Well, to tell you the truth, I was writing Southern fiction before I knew it was Southern fiction. I think <laughs> it's a, a fairly recent um, genre section, if you will. Um, I was writing what was really like mainstream fiction or Oprah type books. You know, they were family type stories that um, had plenty of angst, but resolved itself in a satisfying ending. 
um, not romance. So really, the the reason I label it Southern fiction is because it's not romance, it's not mystery, and real, really, there are not a lot of genres in between. I really started out writing standalone novels, and pretty much even the books that I have that are part of a series can very easily be read as standalones because that's like my style. It's what I liked getting started, and so it's what I tend to write because it's what I enjoy reading. And um, Southern is because my family is from the South, and I had that voice in my head all my life. So it was... Um, it was very natural to write in that voice. And I think the, I think what defines Southern fiction is it's kind of more down home than ordinary fiction. Um, it's not just adding y'all in or something like that. It's an attitude. It's a kind of attitude. And Southerners tend to take their time to think things over and, and um, get more involved, I guess. I think there is a, a an extra layer, if you will. Yeah. It takes a little longer to tell the yeah. story, but it also has a wonderful feel for it. So it, it's something I'm just becoming aware of in my own reading and in my own um, exploring of various genres. One of the things I love about your writing style is that it is clear, it is crisp. You mm -hmm. take your... Um, readers on a journey and i think that's something that you actually want to do but there's also mm -hmm. something i've savored several of your books but this is the book that i'm reading your new book the fault between us there's something that feels familiar about the style and mm -hmm. i don't mean at all i want to make it very clear it is not canned it is not a form mm -hmm. it's it's not formulaic it just feels great to be in your book how do it, you do that it, it, I hope it feels, I should say, I hope it feels like these are friends of yours because when I'm writing a book, I am so into my character. Oh my gosh, I live and breathe that character. I, every single book I've written, the, the good characters and the bad ones, there's a little piece of me in there. And um, I'm actually living that life. And when I go to write a male character, a lot of times I'll model them after my husband. And I, when I'm thinking about a scene, and I can't just ahead of time decide what the man is going to do. So I'll think about it, and I'll think about it in terms of what he would do, how he would react with his mm -hmm. children, or, you know, things like that. And the people become very, very real. I think that, you know... I guess I have a tendency to avoid over explaining, to to okay. stay away from too many, I think too many adjectives sometimes and too many adverbs just cloud the water. And it just, I like to read a passage that I can just read through and never, never question who's, who's speaking or never go back to try and understand it again. So I think that's part of it. And that crispness comes across. Tell me about, since, you know, you and I are of a certain age, if you will, <laughs> um, I love the way you portray your women characters. Templeton in The Fault Between Us knew what she wanted from, yeah. I forget, the age of eight when she started drawing. Talk about the journey of women and what you try to accomplish with the women in your books. It's very funny about that book. This is a really... This shows you, I think, what authors go through. So I think sometimes people don't realize that they think we sit down and we just type out a story and bungo, it's done, but not really so. When I, I started writing this, and I was about 30,000 words in, and I started getting deeper and deeper into Templeton's personality, and I said, wait a minute, I don't know if I can write this book because I don't know if I can adequately think like a woman would think in the early 1900s because the challenges were so different. I mean, they couldn't own property, they couldn't vote, they couldn't do anything really that we can do today. So her wanting to be a designer was an astronomical leap from the norm. Yes. And I said, I'm not sure I can really think in terms of the of the challenges that she'll face. So I set it aside 
And I was thinking about what to write, and I ended up writing a story that was taken from my own family. It's called um, When I Last Saw You. Yes. And my mom was one of 11 children. And much of that story is true about her, the way her life was, that they came from a coal mining town, and the father ran off with a woman and left the mother with those all those kids and how they tracked him down and everything but I remember so often my mother standing at the window or or being at the stove and saying gee I wonder where Willard is now I wonder where Dalford is there were brothers that she actually had lost track of but see I could get in my mother's mindset and I could get in her mom although I never knew any of my grandparents so that was all second hand but I had my mother's voice telling me what she thought and what she did and everything so I wrote that story and you know when I finished it I said you know what this is the exact same time frame as Templeton's story. I can write that. And I went back and finished it and it went just like that, just breezed right through it because I had the mindset then of where who I wanted to be, what that woman was like. Don't you love it when our characters teach us something? Oh, you, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, my, that's one of my favorite things that I learned from my yeah. characters, which obviously come from ourselves, yeah. but we're not in touch with that part of ourselves. Does that's that happen good. to you often that oh, you definitely. start one book and then you write another book in the meantime? Mm -hmm. You're so prolific. Not usually. Usually if I start a book, <clears throat> I'm so in touch with the characters that I just, when I wake up in the morning, that's the first thing I'm thinking about. I'll take the dog for a walk and I'll, the whole time I'm thinking what that character is going to do that day. And I don't have a set number of words that I work on. I write until I feel the scene is like done, you know, that it's like, it's the end of the scene. And I, I haven't, thought beyond that. You know, I, I need to live that next scene the next day or something. So some days it'll be 500 words and some days it'll be a couple thousand. But um, I try to make them meaningful words. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you and you do. Uh, I want to talk, switch just a little bit to the business side of the house, because I'm an entrepreneur. I've started several companies. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk about, to our listeners, please, about your Bent Pine Publishing, because I'm fascinated by mm -hmm. you as an entity, as well as mm -hmm. by the beauty of your words. Well, the funny thing is that um, my husband's my partner in the business. He's the business end of the business. And I do the creative and everything like that. He does all the ordering and accounting and everything. Mm -hmm. Anything anything that looks like business, I give to him. Smart <laughs> um, woman. <laughs> but, you know, he was getting ready to... I didn't start writing until we came to Florida, which was 20 years ago. And um, I was half retired. <laughs> I was working as a consultant with my old company. So it was great. And But I knew I wanted to write and I knew that I wanted to be in Florida. And this was my choice to come down here. Mm -hmm. So Dick had worked for several years. And um, in the meantime, I had started writing and I was sending out a million and one uh, query letters to publishers and everything. And um, got well actually I did have one of my one of the books that was represented by an agent but never never went beyond that it was went to the publishing roundtable but never was published so at, at that point I signed on with another com a smaller company and they published the book and it was the 12th child and um it was called girl child then and um, they published the book and brought it out. And so I was so excited about it. And it was that was pre-ebooks. Mm -hmm. And I started going around doing some speaking engagements, doing some book signings at the stores. And lo and behold, the book started to pick up and sell. And so it would they they brought it out at $14.95. It was only a paperback book. They brought it out at $14.95. And then when it started to sell, they raised the price to $19.95. I said, oh you're out of your mind. I said, John Grisham can't sell a paperback uh -huh. in $19.95. So I just decided I didn't want to work with them anymore. I didn't want to do anything more with them. So what I did was I just I continued to write, 
but I didn't really pursue as much publishing it. And then Dix was to the point where he decided that he was he was ready to retire, but he didn't want to completely retire. So I said, well, what do you think of the idea of maybe being an agent or a publisher? So he said, I don't think much of that idea. <laughs> and he definitely did not want to do it. But after some, I talked him into it finally, and um, he did. And it's been really great. He came from Wall Street, so this business was really foreign to him. I love that um, we, we as women, can have multiple pathways to our publishing. Um, mm -hmm. I had thought about starting a publishing house for a little while, but I just love that you have done it. You represent a few other authors as well. So there's really a legacy that you're leaving um, in storytelling, I think, not only your own work, which is so mm -hmm. important, but um, your whole um, machine, if you will, a little bit. This is such a gracious business. I'll tell you, yeah. when I started out, I did not even know the questions to ask. I mean, yes. really. And there were so many authors that were so generous with their advice and time and everything else to me. And I hope that at this point in, in my career that I'm paying it back to younger authors. And I try to do that. When people write to me and, you know, within reason, <laughs> um, I answer them and I'll point the direction or, you know, give them any words of advice that I can. And I think it's, I think that's part of why I like this being in this business as much as I do, because there is a great spirit of generosity among authors. I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I had written mm -hmm. several books that were nonfiction and then moved into the fiction world. And I was just stunned with how gracious people are. Um, you're part of Blue Sky over on the Facebook yes. world. And just the, the people there, Lainey, uh, Cameron, Patricia mm -hmm. Sands, you are a very special mm -hmm. group. How did you all get together? You know, some of us came, we, long, long ago, when I was just, first, I think I've had about two or three books out. And um, Jillian Dodd had just published her book, That Boy. And I was on Goodreads and I saw it and I read it and I thought it was so cute. And so I wrote to her, you know, on Goodreads and said, oh, I love this book. It's so cute and everything. But we became friends. Then she had joined a group that took a seminar together. Okay. So she said, would you like to join? We, we've since created our own Facebook group just to help each other. Would you like to join? So I said, sure. And I did. And we were called the Destiny Makers. Okay. okay. Jillian came up with that name. And uh, so a lot of these women I met through there. And then other ones, like Patricia Sands, has been a friend for over 20 years. Fabulous. <laughs> and, yeah. Yes, she is. And um, one person introduces you to another, to another. To, Eleni is a fairly recent mm -hmm. friend, but I just adore her lifestyle. <laughs> yes. Um, so. It's, I think, as I said, it's a small industry. Well, it's just great to have had you here today. One of the things I love that uh, people describe your characters is not only are they real, but sometimes they're a little bit quirky. So I like to end up my episodes by asking my guests, is there something quirky about you that we might not find out about you if we're on your website that you can share um, with us? I think the the quirky part is when I when I write a character, and I I guess I've discovered this about myself too since I've been writing, that um, has a, a belief in magic, you know, and um, it's such fun to to go down that rabbit hole, and it's those characters. It's it's magical realism, so they're living a very real story, but by the same token they still believe that magic thing can happen. And I guess I'm like that too. I always believe something really good is gonna happen. Something really magical is gonna happen. And you know what the funny thing is, a lot of times it does. <laughs> I agree. And, you know, mm -hmm. I know one of the things that is true about you is you love to have your stories end with a happy ending. And yes. this has just been such a happy time for me having mm -hmm. you as a guest on The Storytellers. So, Betty Lee Crosby, thank you for being with me today. Well, thank you for having me, Grace. It was a true pleasure. This is the end of The Storytellers episode. It's a copyrighted episode by Grace Salmon and Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Thank you for being with us. 
That concludes this episode of The Storytellers. I'm so glad you could be part of the story today. I hope you share the stories, tell your own, and come back for another episode. Because when our stories are told, everything changes. I'm Grace Salmon.